Good day. It's Professor Resnick again. Um, today I want to discuss uh, with you um, a famous ph uh, philosopher. Um, he unfortunately passed away a few years ago. His name uh, is Richard Rorty, R-O-R-T-Y. Uh, he was, uh, very briefly, a, for years, a professor at Princeton University of, of Philosophy. Um, he taught at other places as well. Um, he was very involved in uh, this so-called postmodern movement across the United States. And uh, he wrote um, this uh, famous book, uh, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, which I signed a, a few pages to you. And let me just add, as far as I know it, he was no Marxist. In fact, he was not uh, terribly uh, happy uh, with the Marxist approach. So he's, for our purposes, a non-Marxist. But his ideas are very important um, to the course and to this notion of overdetermination that we're developing here. So let me, let me talk um, a little bit about Rorty, uh, which hopefully will help you uh, guide your readings. Rorty sets out uh, the traditional philosophical objective, as Rorty understands it, which is the search for a foundation of truth. What philosophy and philosophers uh, are to do is to adjudicate amongst different claims, truth claims, if you will, and provide us with a way of ascertaining what is true and what is not true. Or they, uh, philosophy and philosophers are to provide us with rules with which and by which we can go out, go around figuring out what is true and what is uh, not true. You know, which theories are right, which are wrong, which rules are right, which are wrong. One of the first ideas that he discusses is what is called in, in philosophy the independence of, of the mind, the independence of thinking, um, and experience, the, the, the body, the independence or the dichotomy between the mind and the body. It's sometimes called traditionally the mind-body uh, dualism, the thinking experience dualism. So uh, let's take this course. Um, Marxism you know, is a conceptual object you and I are knowers, that's with our minds. So the question becomes, once we assume there's an independence between Marxism, the conceptual object, uh, and, and us, how do we then uh, bridge this gap of knowledge? How do we figure out uh, Marxism? How do we figure out what are the good ideas, what are the right ideas in, in Marxism? So given the independence between thinking and experience, how do we bridge this gap of knowledge? How do we figure out what is really going on outside of us in this example, in this conceptual object, Marxism? So Rorty discusses that dichotomy, but he also discusses philosophers outside the Marxian tradition who um, discard this presumed independence between thinking and experience. Don't forget, it's a presumed, it's an assumption by philosophers between, um, uh, once again, thinking and experience. There's no experience, these philosophers claim. That, I'm sorry, let me do that again, that was wrong. There's no um, uh, independence, these philosophers claim, because thinking and experience, experience complexly cause one another. And that's consistent with what we did the previous time when we discussed over determination. Everything is both cause and effect. Each depends upon the other for its very existence. Now, in Marxism, there is a parallel attempt by some Marxists in the history of the tradition to also reject the independence between thinking and experience. Rorty pays no attention to them because, as I mentioned to you, he's not interested really in, in, in Marxism and he doesn't think that Marxists are capable of making this kind of argument. But in your reading, it's one of the reasons it's assigned to you, in Knowledge and Class, there are attempts by Lukács, um, Gramsci, Althusser, Hindus and Hurst, and the others mentioned there, um, Lenin, I believe, is mentioned there, who also, in one way or the other, reject the independence between the two. So it's kind of interesting that outside the Marxian tradition in the traditional philosophical uh, discourse of, of, of uh, the non-Marxian uh, 
tradition. There is a rejection of the independence. And within the Marxian tradition, there's also this kind of, of rejection, although the people often don't talk to one another. Rorty claims that empiricism and rationalism, once again, those are our two traditional uh, epistemologies, are theories that attempt to, to quote Rorty, escape from history. Very, very nice uh, phrasing. I want to examine that uh, important claim because it connects to many of the things we're going to discuss and many of the things on your reading. First, both empiricism and rationalism um, assert in common that there is an absolute truth outside of us uh, to be discovered or to be revealed to us, typically revealed by thought, discovered by experience. Now, what's this truth that is asserted to be out there? Well, truth is independent of history. Okay? It's, that's the definition of what is truth. It's something which is independent of our political history, our cultural history, our natural history. Our, our, it's independent of our social history. And let me just add, because it already doesn't, it's also independent from the Marxian perspective of our class history. Truth doesn't depend, it's not socially contrived, it's, it's, it's outside of us. Okay? So, it has an, a, uh, let me use different words, it has a, truth has a prior independent existence to any knower or to the community of, of knowers. It's independent of us, there's our dichotomy again. There is the assumed dualism of rationalism and, and empiricism. Well, if the truth is outside of us, how do we get it? And the answer is that we need some kind of standard, some kind of way to ascertain that which is outside of us, that, you know, to figure out what is true. And that standard that we have to use has to be neutral, it has to be uh, intrinsically uh, uh, accurate, it has to be independent of us as knowers, so that we can have full confidence that we are gaining knowledge that is valid. Okay? Empiricism offers its standard, which is that of experience. So experience is the way, the standard, that we can bridge that gap and figure out what is true and what is not true. Rationalism offers a different standard. Uh, rationalism offers uh, reason uh, as the bridge to knowledge. That which we can be confident in, which is again intrinsically true and accurate, so that we can figure out what's going on. Notice that these rationalists and empiricists are offering two different standards. They both believe in a standard, but two different ones, and hence they've been arguing with one another for thousands of years. Rorty, he says, and he's very provocative, he says, there's no such thing as an absolute truth to be found. All theories, which include rationalism and empiricism themselves as theories of knowledge, all theories only produce claims about the truth. So all we have are different truth claims emanating from different theories, which are relative to different knowers, which are relative to different societies. So all we have, according to Rorty, are relative truths. <clears throat> what we don't have is what we do not have, according to him, is absolute truth, so that's a counterclaim to what the rationalists and the empiricists have. According to Rorty, there's no uh, standard that we can use which is intrinsically true, accurate, independent of us, that we can close that gap. The reason there's no standard, because all standards are overdetermined. In terms of rationalism and empiricism, the logic is that he says to the empiric empiricist, you can't use your standard of experiences because experience is, if you want, corrupted, is shaped by thought. And he says to the rationalist, rationalist, you can't use that. That's not independent of our experiences. Our political, economic, cultural experiences shape how we think. Just like we argued before that Marx's thinking and Marx's experiences were complexly shaped by each other. Okay, they're not independent, hence there's no standard. So, a problem occurs, which is 
assuming Rudy is right, or assuming, if you want, this, this notion of overdetermination is right, a problem occurs when a particular claim about the world is turned into, magically, the world. That's what rationalists and empiricists do, according to Rorty. In other words, what rationalists and empiricists do is take a particular claim about the world, or theoreticians in general, when they deploy rationalism and empiricism, they take their interesting and fascinating claim about the world and turn it magically into the world. It's no longer a relative truth, it becomes the absolute truth. But what they've done, what they've done, according to Rorty, is take, merely taken their idea about the world, their claim, their truth claim, and turned it into the world, they you know, make it an idea into the world. The consequence of that, and I told you we're going to worry about the consequence of epistemology, is that somebody's idea of the world becomes the world and Everybody else's ideas, then, have to conform to somebody's idea of the world. Wow. Rather than having different truth claims competing with one another, what we have now is that a person's idea of the world, magically turned into the world, to the truth, enables that person to use his or her truth as the standard with which and against which everybody else's claim about the world, ideas, are to be tested. So, someone's ideas of the world have become the standard, the absolute truth, against which all other theories are to be tested to see if they conform correctly or come close to that particular idea. And we're going to see, and I'm going to mention to you, that a person, another philosopher in the 20th century, is going to talk about this his name was Foucault, F-O-U-C-A-U-L-T. Okay. Dialectical materialism, or overdetermination, claims there is no such standard of truth that exists or could ever exist. Experience is thought to shape uh, our ideas, and our ideas are thought to shape our experiences. In other words, uh, they only exist in relationship to one another. Neither one is independent of the other, and hence neither one can be a standard of the other. Don't forget what a standard is. It's something which is immune from causation. And so what dialectical materialism has claimed, and Rorty is claiming, there is no such thing in the world. There is nothing in the world, whether it be experience or thought or anything else, which is immune from causation. Everything is, 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 is uh, overdetermined, and hence nothing can be that kind of standard. So what we have then are a variety of different truth claims which includes Marx's notion of class exploitation. That's the first lecture. So that's a particular claim about the world which competes and contends with other claims about the world and that's all we have. We have these different truth claims. So you can see what's, done, what's happened here. There is a, now a space created for Marxism, this, this thing that intrigues people but also makes them very fearful, that strikes this open nerve in society. And Marxism now has kind of elevated its status through this kind of argument. It becomes just another claim about the world and there's no way to demote that particular claim unless you deploy this kind of magical step. So what I want to do next time is uh, explore this epistemological argument and talk a bit more about the consequences of it and come back to this uh, uh, philosopher uh, Foucault. Thank you.